slides are like micro small, and I apologize for that. Uh, I just wanted to try and fit it all on one page. So we finished up with the standard American diet, and and then we we focus on things like like heart disease, and and back in the late seventies. Um, food industries made an enemy of fat. So we had this fat-free craze that still persists today. And, and everything is low fat. And this isn't a good thing. It's really not a good thing at all. Because fat is an absolute essential part um, of, our, of our makeup and, and our cells need fat. And we need fat. And, and so what's really causing things like heart disease and some of these inflammatory disorders. And um, Another little nugget for you here, if you go onto YouTube and you look up Sugar, the Bitter Truth, uh, it's, it's a little dry, but if, if you stick with it, you get some really good stuff out of it. And, and this physician has basically showed how sugar your liver recognizes sugar almost exactly the same as alcohol. And so sugar, the average American is eating about 152 pounds of sugar. I mean, I'm a little guy here. I, I only weigh 156. And so that's like all my, almost my whole body weight. It, did you guys see uh, Jamie Oliver's Food Revolution? Did you see that show that was on briefly? And then it, it just didn't go. This, this guy, he was trying to... Um, make schools healthier and, and spread a lot of awareness. Really good, really good thing, but it just it, it didn't last. And he had this really cool episode where he, he put um, he put sugar on a whole bus and he, he filled the whole bus with sugar to show you a visual of how much sugar we eat in a year. It was really crazy. You open the door and all the sugar just comes out. And so really what happens is our liver recognizes uh, fructose just kind of like alcohol as a very similar breakdown process. And, and that's actually what's, what's raising things like LDL and throwing these, these numbers out of whack. So you hear the good cholesterol, HDL versus LDL. A lot of this is actually coming from sugar and the inflammation. So sugar is actually our, our number one enemy in terms of our health. And I'm talking more about processed sugar. And, it's, and fructose is fructose, but at least when you're eating it in a form of like a fruit, nature put it in a nice little package and, and brought the fiber with it so your body can assimilate that at a very slower rate versus high fructose corn syrup that's just like BAM right to your liver there and it, it sees that as whoa this is, a, this is a toxin I don't know what to do with this so freaks out creates inflammatory processes and then and then we have a lot of these problems like heart disease and many other inflammatory disorders I used to think things like candida were a myth I don't know if you guys have heard about candida. It's still not very, it's still not very well recognized. Um, it's a form of uh, basically a yeast overgrowth, and in its worst, in its worst state, I mean, it, it can be deadly. But most people never reach that. They just kind of have this little bit of a candida overgrowth all the time, and that can manifest as chronic yeast infections. It can manifest as skin disorders. Um, and it's commonly just overlooked. But I've seen personally uh, people very close to me who have suffered with this, and I, I feel like I have as well. Um, Candida was actually, Candida albicans is the full name of this yeast organism. And it was actually introduced by Hershey, um, the, the chocolate bar company. I don't remember exactly why they did it, but it had something to do with easing their production. And so now we have this massive overgrowth. It's another one of those organisms that when your, your gut flora gets out of balance, your, your microbiome that we talked about gets out of balance, this likes to overgrow and cause a lot of problems for people. So sugar is worth looking into. Um, I had a question during the break there about um, meat production, and, and I, I didn't, wasn't familiar with the exact MSU place that they're talking about, but this is, uh, have, you guys, have you guys heard about confined animal feeding operations? Just about everybody. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a real travesty. And, and this one actually is, is probably better than others because it actually has windows. 
I, I almost thought about putting a more depressing picture on there, but I, I don't know, it's, it's, it's actually probably a better one. Um, Consumer Reports did a article recently and they took over 300 samples of chicken and 98% of them, including organic, were infected with one of five different microorganisms. Um, dangerous ones, like Campylobacter and things like that. So these are, these are things that if, you're, if you eat meat, I highly encourage you to use a meat thermometer. Don't just cook by time. Make sure the internal temperature of that meat is what it should be. And, and so really, all hospital acquired infections that we deal with now have been traced back to these confined animal feeding operations. It didn't really start in the hospitals. It started at these confined animal feeding operations because they're always feeding these chickens, thousands of them, with low doses of antibiotics because they're bathing in their own feces all the time. They have no, usually no sunlight, and they can't walk around. They can barely stand. They can't. They're 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 down in the mud and then they're trapped because they don't have the strength to get up. And then it's it's a condition where these kind of organisms thrive, and they're always getting more doses of antibiotics. So we have a real problem in our hospitals. Hence. 400,000 deaths per year in hospitals. And some of that is medical negligence, but a lot of it has to do with these infections that have become such big. We're running out of antibiotics to treat these. We can't keep ahead of these organisms because nature is so smart and it will always find a way to, um, to work around. If you would like to know what the top offenders to gut health are, here's what I would say. The top one would be long-term repeated or high-dose antibiotics. Now, that's, now, antibiotics serve a great function, and we need them, absolutely. Um, but it's overprescribed, they're overused, and especially in things like these confined animal feeding operations. And so most of them are kind of like a bombshell. It's like a carpet bomb that goes into your gut, and it doesn't, they're not very selective, because usually when when you have an infection, they're not going to take a little culture swab when you go to your healthcare professional and, and figure out exactly what it is. So a lot of times a broad spectrum antibiotic is prescribed and it, in turn there's a lot of collateral damage and it, it, it goes into your gut flora as well. Um, pesticides, like Roundup, we talked about that real briefly there. and um, and, and and the inflammatory meat products, processed meats, are a real problem. The higher you eat up the food chain, the more you're exposed to pesticides, and the more you're exposed to this. So that's why a lot of vegans and vegetarians don't have some of these inflammatory problems. Um, and I'm not saying that you need to go entirely vegan or vegetarian, but if you look at tissue samples of cadavers and things like that, they've shown that 95%, up to 95% of the pesticides that we consume are from dairy and from meat products. Um, so processed foods, of course, a lot of inflammation there because they use those oils and things that, that we talked about, the canola and, and the vegetable oils. Um, the vegetable oils are, are often overlooked. They're often overlooked as, as something that's not a problem, but we don't think about this when we're out, um, out to eat. Uh, alcohol, not as much, but it, it can be a problem. It's not, it's not as big of a thing. And I specifically put pasteurized dairy here. Um, there's a big debate. Uh, have you guys ever tasted raw milk? Yes. Uh, what does it taste like to you compared to the milk that we drink today? Yeah, it's different. I, I mean, I think it's better. Um, there's You've been bombarded by the Food and Drug Administration how you're going to die if you drink raw milk. And if you get it from the wrong source, you might. Um, so there's a, there's a risk analysis here. There's a risk versus benefits kind of thing. If, the, if you take milk, you take dairy, and then you pasteurize it, it creates a lot of dead uh, bacterial debris. So we have to keep going to higher and higher temperatures all the time. First they started with pasteurization. Then they started with, if you look on milk now, it'll say ultra-pasteurized. 
So that means that they've like really cranked up the temperature on this. And, and so you have all this dead bacteria debris in the milk and in dairy products. And so your body sees that as, as an inflammatory kind of thing and it's going to respond as if it's an invader. And so when you have a cold and you say, you know, I drink some, I drink some milk, and I'm like, man, I'm really mucusy. You know, that's why you're having an inflammatory response to that. So it's kind of like, well, there's some risk, not really as much as they say, um, with raw dairy, and and then there's there's some benefits of pasteurization. Overall, though, the campaign of milk does the body good is a big fat lie, and and that that campaign has been going on forever, and it's still going on. It's been linked to multiple sclerosis, inflammation, seasonal allergies. The industry is disgusting. And if you look inside, I'm talking about, I'm not talking about your average farmer. I'm talking about these big mechanized systems that the majority of your milk that you get on the shelf is, is where it's coming from. So what we end up with is kind of this vicious cycle. We have poor lifestyle choice, choices that leads to gut health. Um, suffering leads to a lack of energy and then your systemic health suffers <clears throat> and it keeps repeating itself so here's the good news what can you do about it I, I mean this this is really what I, I, I kind of want want you to take home here is adopting a whole foods primarily plant-based diet and primarily organic whenever possible so we can avoid those things like roundup and and we'll talk about a little bit more how you can do that economically without break it, breaking the bank buying organic stuff. Um, and the literature has shown on these primarily plant-based diets that there's a significant improvement in symptoms of a variety of gut ailments, including, including Crohn's, inflammatory bowel disease, and acid reflux. You have decreased inflammatory markers in near across the board. And so the basics of this, I think all the rest of these are in your slides, but I'm, I'm going to go over real quick here, is is it requires planning and effort. It's, it's making this a priority. And returning to our roots and using technology responsibly. So that means using things like dehydrators, food processors, juicers, blenders, things that we can make this food available to us and so we can get these nutrients in our body so we can heal ourselves. And we have to take it one step at a time because this process is really overwhelming. And just like here at Mindful Movement, it takes a long time to retrain some of these things. You need to drop all fast food completely. I, I mean it. And I know it's hard. And sometimes I still smell those McDonald's fries. I'm just like, man, it smells so good. <laughs> but, but the consequences of it um, are, just, are just unknown how endless it, it can go. And you can make in bulk, too, you know, using things like slow cookers. It doesn't have to be this big hassle all the time. Here's another, another little fun thing. This is a, I know you can't read this, that doesn't matter. This is KFC's pot pie. This is another one of my nerd moments where I went online and I, I went onto KFC's website. And I was like, I wonder what's in that thing, because I just saw that commercial. And I think there's a couple ores in here, depending on the supplier. I don't know, but that's, that's the KFC pot pie. It looks really good on a commercial. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of fun stuff in there. <laughs> Um, this is this is what this is what fast food will get you, um, and and then getting more into the specifics, <clears throat> cook using non-inflammatory oils. Okay? Start using things like coconut oil. Start using things like grapeseed oil, or animal fat if that's okay with you from a source that you trust that isn't feeding their animals genetically modified corn and soy. Um, and then we have. I, didn't, I don't have a handout of this with you guys, but the, what's called the Clean 15 and the Dirty Dozen. Clean 15 are the 15 crops that have the lowest level of pesticide residue, and the Dirty Dozen are things like strawberries and most green leafy vegetables that will have the highest amount of pesticides. So if you're trying to eat healthier, and you're trying to do it without breaking the bank, and you don't want to buy everything organic, this is a good, this is a good place to start with the, the Clean 15 Dirty Dozen. So just Google that, you'll find it, and it will give you all those different yes. crops. I've got the, the card. Oh, nice. Keep it, so if anybody wants to see it. Yeah. Very nice. From the Environmental Working Group. Oh, very, yeah, very good website. You got a lot of good stuff. Um, I think that, I think that website's actually on your guys' summary. 
on there, ewg.org. Great work. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, what about uh, olive oil? Olive oil, good, good question. Uh, olive oil is, is great um, for like salad dressings and relatively raw. Um, it has a high, a high point where it, it gets to, um, creates a lot of free radicals when cooking with it. So if you're cooking with it in low temperatures and just kind of simmering, that's okay. But if you start to get to that really high point and you're trying to fry and things like olive oil, it creates a lot of what are called free radicals and creates a lot of inflammation. Very good question. Basically, we got to start making all our food from scratch. I give you guys some recipes on there. There's a couple typos. I think tomato is spelled with an E. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. And then there's one that, and the quinoa one. It's the the vegetarian quinoa chili, which I used to think was pronounced quinoa. Um, is it the last little part on there says uh, it should be just just simmer for 30 minutes. <laughs> that, that was on the next page. It ends with stir in the cook. Yeah, and then cover and simmer for 30 minutes. <laughs> um, you've got to get gluten out of your life. And, and this isn't just a fad. I mean, the research is growing on it so much. You've got to find alternatives. There's a lot of great flours out there, chickpea flours and quinoa flours and just about any kind of flour you can find it. Um, and not all of them are extremely expensive. you just got to look. Got to look around. Look at places like Meyer. Want to have a lot of fruits and veggies if tolerable. Um, kind of the the rule of twelve. If you have a uh, if you have something that a food that seems averse to you, like you can't get into the healthy foods, you, sometimes you have to try it about twelve times. Is what the research is saying now, in order for your taste buds to adapt to that. Our taste buds can adapt to healthy foods. And you just have to try, and you have to try, and you have to try, until you start to like it. Um, fermented foods are, are another thing that's, that's sorely missing. There's a cool book out there uh, by a guy named Sandor Katz, and he is like this fermentation guru, and it's, it's awesome because he goes to all these different cultures and countries, and he looks at the way that fermented foods are a big part of their culture. It's not part of the American diet. You know, Germans have sauerkraut, um, a lot of Asian cultures have kimchi, uh, Russians have kvass drinks. You can even see those in the, the shelves that you go to Foods for Living and see the beet kvass things, really good. Um, what those are is it's, it's they're plants that have been broken down um, and, and have this beneficial bacteria. And you can make some, a lot of these yourself. And if you're gonna consume dairy, Go raw, but again, there's some risks with that, but it's not nearly as much as is made out to be as long as you know your source. And, you, and with any kind of food, you should always visit the farms and see what their practices are. There's, there's risk with everything that you do. In reality, humans are not, supposed, are not meant to eat grains. Um, we can. We can. But if it, this whole food, or this whole <laughs> grains push for the longest time now, is is the wrong way of looking at it. If, if you want to eat grains, you have to be kind to your grains and your grains will be kind to you. And what I mean to that is we have to prepare them because things like cows, they have multiple stomachs and so they're able to get um, the food into their rumen and they're able to break these down and ferment the grains before they digest them. We don't have that, we have one stomach. And so these plants, they don't necessarily want to be eaten. So what they do is they have, they have their own mechanisms to protect themselves. So they have what are called anti-nutrients, things like lectins. And, and these lectins are nutrient zappers. So they, they, what they do is they bind to nutrients that you're taking into your body, and they steal them from you, essentially. And so you, you have to soak grains before um, you're going to use them. You have to soak them or sprout certain grains or beans and things like that, which isn't really that big of a hassle. It just takes a little planning. You just have to put it in a jar, put a little water in it, and, and then go from there. There's a lot of resources online that you can find about that. What, instead of saying what you can't eat, I'd rather say what you can eat um, to nourish your gut and to help heal. And, and a lot of it is, 
is going back to fresh organic vegetables and fruits. And then if you do eat meat, look for grass-finished meats. Not just grass-fed, grass-finished meats. And that's the, that's the term that you want to use when you ask a butcher or you ask a farmer. You use as your cattle grass-finished. The difference between grass-fed and grass-finished is, again, going back to that, that verbiage of, well, I fed my, my, my cattle uh, grass one meal, and then the rest of it I fed <clears throat> genetically modified corn and soy. That can happen, and it does, and it's crazy. So look for these grass-finished meats or get it from a source that you trust. Start using gluten-free flours, and don't just take a shotgun approach with supplements. There, we, you have to have a clinically based supplement regimen from somebody who really knows what they're, they're talking about. Vegetable juices are great, and if, if you get a juicer, there's a lot, they're a lot cheaper now because they're becoming so popular. It's a great way to get those micronutrients that we're all starving for um, from the plants and extract them in high, qual in high quantities. Really easy thing to do. Again, nuts and beans, they all have those anti-nutrients. We have to soak them and prepare them in order, especially if your gut is compromised. Some people can handle it okay, but if you have gut problems, you gotta be soaking your grains. Animal fats are actually good for you in, in the right amount of quantities. And you, if you desire, you can use them for cooking too. And then, I, and then if you're going dairy, I would go raw, unpasteurized dairy because you don't have that inflammation. So, real quick, um, I want to do a mindful eating exercise with you guys real quick. So you all have your cup of nuts. <laughs> all right, so really, this is about slowing down okay, trying to um, use all our senses. This really ties in well with what we do here at Mindful Movement. And so I'm going to walk you through a quick little exercise and I'd like you guys to follow along and give it a try. Um, ideally, after this I would say when you go home, think about chewing 15 to 20 times. Just start consciously thinking about it and eventually you'll just do it. Um, so the following exercise is simple and will only take a few minutes. Find a small piece of food, such as a raisin or a nut, or a small cookie. Um, you can use any food that you like. Eating with mindfulness is not necessarily about deprivation of rules. Begin by exploring this little piece of food, using as many senses as possible. First, look at the food. Notice its texture. Notice its color. Now close your eyes and explore the food with your sense of touch. What does this food feel like? Is it hard or soft? Grainy or sticky? Moist or dry? Notice that you're not being asked to think, but just to notice different aspects of your experience, using one sense at a time. This is what, what it means to eat mindfully. Before you eat, explore this food with your sense of smell. What do you notice? Now begin eating. No matter how small the bite of food you have, take at least two bites to finish it. Take the first bite. Please chew very slowly, noticing the actual sensory experience, chewing and tasting. Remember, you don't need to think about your food to experience it. You might want to close your eyes for a moment and focus on the sensations of chewing and tasting before continuing. Notice the texture of the food, the way it feels in your mouth. Notice if the intensity of the flavor changes moment to moment. <coughs> Take about 20 more seconds to very slowly finish this first bite of food being aware of the simple sensations of chewing and tasting. I'll give you guys a few seconds. Now please take your last and second bite 
as, as before, chew very slowly while paying close attention to the actual sensory experience of eating, the sensations and movements of chewing, the flavor of the food as it changes, and then the sensations of swallowing that food. Just pay attention moment by moment. And then just kind of see what the after effects of that are and how you feel. And so that doesn't mean we have to eat like it's going to take us an hour and a half every time we eat a meal. We don't always have to eat slow to eat mindfully. But at first we kind of do to get that practice and that idea of cultivating awareness. Um, last couple of slides here. Anybody else got a book out of here? Probably got about 10 more minutes. Okay. Um, bread is very different today than it was considered in biblical times as the staff of life. Cross hybridization, which is two plants being brought together to make a plant, is very different than genetic modification, as we said. And so now, instead of 1 to 2 percent gluten, we have about 50 percent gluten protein in the modern strains of wheat. And then we have this onulin problem. So go gluten free. So, in summary of those, we consume wheat. The wheat contains gliadin within the gluten. It signals and activates these little key and lock places within our small intestine. We produce zonulin. It degrades those that spackle in the wall, those tight junctions, and it increases the permeability through our gut so food and microbes, bacteria, viruses, fungi can all make their way into our bloodstream. This is slightly oversimplified. Uh, another great book, if you're interested in wheat, is called, or learning about gluten, it's called Wheat Belly. It's by Dr. Davis. Uh, and it really shows how it's a big part of the inflammatory process. So, some other fantastic news is that by doing these things, you have a lot of unexpected benefits. You don't, if, if you do it smart, you're not gonna have a, a substantial increase in your grocery bills. You're gonna have less medical bills. You're gonna have an improvement in seasonal and food allergies because you're reestablishing that gut flora in those tight junctions. That can actually happen. You can restore those. And so we have to, um, remember that we don't need to go hunting for the individual allergy. In physical therapy, that would be like, if you came in with shoulder pain, I would just focus on one muscle up in your shoulder. I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna start down the whole chain and kind of look from there. You're not gonna have any side effects. I saw a, a commercial for, <laughs> it was an Ambien, I think it was Ambien, and I timed it. I sat there with my watch and I'm like, okay, how long is this side effects thing going to go on for? <laughs> 37 seconds later, it's done. And, and But as long as they have butterflies and happy people in their pharmaceutical commercials, then, well, then it's okay. I mean, there's no problem there, right? Uh, and so you can have a symptom reduction and possible reversal of, of some of the things that you're dealing with. And the other great thing about, about this approach is you're building communities and you're getting to know people who grow your food along the whole process. And you can do this together. You can make friends, you can establish relationships. The alternative destroys relationships and it's destructive. Fermentation is things like sauerkraut. It's very much an acquired taste because as Americans we haven't really ate this stuff in our lives. Most of us haven't anyways, unless you come from, you know, a a German background or, or, or something like that where you're eating sauerkraut on a regular basis. If you look at sauerkraut on the shelves that's been pasteurized so there's no real value to it. So if you just go to the store and you pick up a thing of sauerkraut, it'll probably say pasteurized on it. 
That's not, and so a lot of times it's just better to make your own. It's really not that hard. And I have a, a on my sheet there, I have my YouTube channel. I, I walk you through step by step on how to make your own um, sauerkraut and probiotics and your own raw dairy yogurt. And, and so these methods of getting more nutrients in our body are things like soaking, sprouting, and dehydrating. And so the big buzzword right now is probiotics. And there's so much confusing things when you walk into a store and you're like, which one do I buy? I don't know. And really the best, the best thing to do is to make your own. And it's not that hard. I, on my video, I, I show you how you can make those in 15 minutes. And the benefit of making your own probiotic is that you won't have any fillers in it. You'll be pretty much guaranteed that you're going to get hundreds of billions of microorganisms within them instead of like a billion or 500 million. Sounds like a lot, but it's really not when we consider we have 100 trillion in our body. And then you can go on that YouTube channel that I put on there. If you're really having gut problems, you got to be taking probiotics. And, and sometimes you have to start really slow and small because people get a little worse before they get better. I recommend starting a, a food journal and tracking what we've talked about today. So take a 30-day challenge where you are just, even, or if you just want to do a week, and just monitor these things and kind of see where you're going with this and are you using all these oils and how much are you going out to eat and how much are you eating mindfully and how quickly are you rushing through some of these things and record the quantities of these things that you're eating and then the challenges that you might have. Kefir is another one. Um, we're kind of short on time. If you guys want to ask me about that, I'll be happy to afterwards. Um, shopping, you want to look around the perimeter of the store. So you want to shop around the outside of the store because that's usually where a lot of the less uh, processed things are. And I like to go by the great grandma or pronunciation rule, which is if you can't pronounce the ingredient, then don't buy it. If your great grandma doesn't know what the heck that is, don't buy it. And you want to try and buy fresh or frozen whenever possible. Frozen is actually sometimes better than fresh in the stores because these have to be shipped from one distribution center to another, and then it's shipped from a warehouse, and then it's finally shipped to your grocery store where it sits on the shelf for weeks sometimes, or several days, so by then your, your food at the very least is at least two weeks old. And so there's a lot of nutrients that have broken down by that time. So sometimes frozen is better because they freeze it right then. Look for the USDA organic seal. And then look for products now. This is a third-party project called the... Whoop. Mm -hmm. What happened there? You lost it. There it is. There it is. There it is. Oh, okay. And look for the third-party... Um, this is called non-GMO project. <laughs> no, I think my... Maybe. There it is. Okay. And they... This isn't all organic, so this is another way you can get GMOs out of your life. It has to be verified through this company, and you can reduce the amount of GMOs. It's on a lot of products now. They have tens of thousands, I think. If you want to buy organic and do it economically, there's some ways to do that. Visit farmers markets, buy in bulk. Um, a CSA is a community supported agriculture, and and so that is where you buy into a share of a farmer, and they deliver um, set food to you every week. Uh, the USDA Organic is, is one of the few governmental programs that I think, in terms of the food system anyways, is, is actually a very beneficial program. There are some specifics about what organic means, and I'll be happy to talk to you afterwards if you're interested. And then, lastly, a few things here is, is supplements. There's, there's very little regulation within the supplement industry, and so we have a lot of what are called excipients or fillers because and those are more found in the big companies versus the little ones so a lot of times I recommend buying from smaller companies it's not always the case but a lot of times you have a lot of extra stuff GMP means good manufacturing practices you can look for that on your supplements it usually means they have to abide by a little stricter rules so there's very little regulation in the supplement industry and that's why 
there's such a bad image about supplements because a lot of them out there are kind of garbage. And our bodies uh, tend to absorb liquids better. So sometimes if we're looking at the specifics, I'm not going to recommend any specific supplements to you guys um, unless you come talk to me because this, again, it has to be clinically based. So relative risk is what we need to consider when we're looking at our choices. We can't be perfect. Perfectionism is a fool's errand. And so what are the biggest offenders? We have the dirty dozen, the clean 15, and GMOs. I don't really know how dangerous those are because there, there are no clinical trials. I can't prove to you that they're extremely dangerous from a scientific perspective. Vegetable oils, um, frequent and excessive antibiotic use, and eating way up the food chain. There's really no cookie cutter approach to treating whatever disorder you might be dealing with. You really have to have clinical diagnosis and, and clinical assistance. So what I've shared with you today I think is a good framework and kind of start you down your, your road of healing. Uh, Coco Newton is a, a nutritionist who's really helped me a lot. I left a business card out there for her. Uh, I, I've come such a long way with her, and, and she's actually, um, there's a guy here in town who's a good friend of mine named Craig Oster, and he's survived Lou Gehrig's disease for greater than 20 years now, which is unheard of. Most people live like two years, three years, and a lot of it is in part to her. So if you're, if you're suffering from something, I definitely recommend um, checking her out. We are going to do a part two, and and it, it will be June, it'll be that first Saturday in June. I don't have the exact date right here. But what I'm going to go over then is kind of meal preparation for busy people, how to nourish uh, the whole body through food, more tips for systemic whole body healing, um, things to keep reducing inflammation. I'll show you some of these methods like soaking, dehydrating, how you can do these things and how you can incorporate them so you can decide if these methods are right for you. And how to meal plan effectively, we'll go more into food labels and reading food labels. And so I challenge you guys to take some of this information, see how it can fit into your own life, and then meet us back here on June 5th. If you guys, if you guys sign up, you'll get a $5 discount if you sign up today. And, and then we'll go into some of those methods and we can, it'll be more of an open forum where we can talk to each other and we can talk about after learning this and taking some of these things in, we can talk back and forth and, and say what were some of the challenges that we dealt with. So that'll be the first Saturday in June. And I think, I think Sue said this to me before about some people are almost offended that we expect you to, we expect you to know yourself that well. But you really can know yourself this well and this is well within your means to be able to do that. My website, I write on a lot of different topics. I have an integrative health blog, and I and I write about nutrition, wellness, and many other things as well. Uh, if you go on there, you'll get a lot more information over time. I have a lot more things on the gut in there. And sign up for my mailing list. I'll definitely send you guys updated things. The re other resources are on your slides, and that'll do it. I'll be taking some questions. If you guys, if you guys don't feel comfortable asking questions in the whole group, then feel free to come see me. Um, email me, I'm more than happy, you know, I love talking about this stuff, obviously, so definitely just send me an email later if you got to get going, and otherwise you can stick around and ask some questions. Thank you very much. Yes? Um, quick question, well, two of them. One of them is about the slide that you kind of skimmed over right. the keeper. Yeah. That's, that's, I'd like to, I guess, hear what you would have okay. said. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Keeper is, let me, let me see if I can go back to it. Why is my computer acting so goofy? Otherwise, I'm sure you're going to have right a there. lot of it off the top of your head. Yeah. It, it's, a, it's a form of symbiotic, what it is, is like, they're colonies of microorganisms. So that's, that's a little different than other types of fermented foods because it's all these different microorganisms put together and are called grains. They look like little cauliflower pieces or something right there. Those are the grains. And in order to start kefir, you have to find somebody else who's making kefir and order these little grains. Or you can get them on Amazon for like five bucks and you can start 
making your own kefir. There are different types of kefir. So this is another fermented beverage. There's dairy kefir, there's coconut kefir, or kefir, some people call it kefir, I call it kefir, or water kefir. Um, and so there, the advantage of those is that you're getting a whole bunch of different microorganisms. The, the disadvantage is that some of them, uh, especially coconut and water, require you to use sugar. And, and you have to, so if sugar is an issue for you personally, and you find yourself really sensitive to sugar, then it's probably not a good option. The dairy would f feed on the lactose, so not as big of an issue. Dairy kefir or kefir. You see that in the dairy, you know, in the dairy section at the grocery store. Right. right. Again, I recommend you make your own. Right. Okay. But yeah. Of course, you didn't say anything about fish. About fish. Healthy eating of fish. Oh man, that's like a whole nother lecture. Um, in real quick, I. I think that overall people should start to reduce seafood. And here's why, not because of the inherent value of seafood, because the Mediterranean diet is very well proven that it reduces cardiovascular complications and is great for overall health and inflammation. But the problem is our, our waters have been destroyed. And I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but Fukushima, that meltdown that happened, is still leaking hundreds of gallons of radioactive um, waste into the sea now. It's not in the media, but it's it's happening. So it's not that big of a problem yet because there's it, it has a lot of water to dilute all that radiation over. But it, it will be an issue. And if you're going to eat tuna, that's probably your biggest risk factor because tuna migrate from the west coast of California and go all the way over to the east coast of Japan and come straight back in a line. And so they're going to be um, the most at risk. So and it's, if you could find a source of, of completely clean fish, then yeah, I, I think in its inherent nature it would be okay. But in our world, it's not really a rea reality, and mercury is such a problem now with that. There is a local farmer that raises shrimp mm -hmm. by a certain method. Are you familiar with that? I've heard about that. Yeah, most farm-raised shrimp is not a good thing, but I, I know what you're talking about. This is about. a very right. small they operation. Used a, they used, didn't they use some kind of like plant-based like seaweed or something? I, I, he's at the market. Yeah. The See, that would be market. that would be a better option. Mm -hmm. That would definitely be a better option. He's doing some fish too. Is he? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, is there a type of salmon that is okay? I'm sorry. A type of what? Salmon. Oh, salmon. Um, a lot of it comes from. I mean, probably more if you can get like the Alaskan or Canadian wild caught would be a better option for you because versus some that's that we have a lot coming from China actually, and so I would I would I would try and avoid the farm raised salmon because they feed them genetically modified corn and soy and they're not meant to eat genetically modified corn and soy. Good question. Go ahead. <laughs> For me? Okay. Yeah. Um, you mentioned sprouted, sprouted um, grains. Yeah. And there, uh, there's a lot of sprouted grain now on the market. Right. For bread. Right. Is are those reasonable, or is that pro over processed and just kind of a marketing thing now? I think Ezekiel is probably going to be your best bet if you see those. Those breads, they don't last as long. They have to be frozen. They definitely have an acquired taste. The first time I tasted it, I thought it was like cardboard. Um, but yes, better. Because it's going to, the, the sprouting and soaking process actually breaks down some of the, um, the gluten. It breaks down the gluten. Are you better off getting your bread from someplace like Breadsmith rather than Myers or Kroger? Probably yes. Because most of those are mass produced and there's a lot of fillers in the bread. Yeah. So, yeah. Like yep. They do not offer gluten as free as I understand. No. At this time. Yeah, not that I'm aware of. Meyer does have a really nice organic and naturals line and they're and they're committed to trying to have GMOs out of their food. So that's another cool thing. If you if you're trying to eat better is to look for the Meyer Naturals or the Meyer Organic brand and they're committed to trying to eat free the GMOs. Any other questions? Yeah. What about dark chocolate? 
dark chocolate. <laughs> Better than milk chocolate. <laughs> because and, and chocolate in itself is, is really good. Uh, my fiance and I use uh, cacao, which is, is actually the British original word. Well, the British couldn't pronounce um, uh, cacao, so they started to call it cocoa. And so, really now, it, cacao is raw chocolate, and then if you, if you put that in, you're baking with it, and you put some sweetener in it, like stevia or agave nectar or something like that, then it would be a lot better than some of the other things that are on the market. Dark chocolate better, because less sugar, and usually it's... It's like, I heard it had antioxidants in it. Mm hmm It does. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you get on sweeteners. Um, stevia is a good one to use. Stevia is a good one. Stevia is a great one. And some people say that it's it's too bitter with baking and stuff, but I, 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 haven't, I haven't seen that that much. And, and if it is, there, there are other options as well. I, I like, I mean, the agave is probably okay, but fructose is fructose and sugar is sugar, any way that you split it. Thank you guys. If you have any more questions, you're welcome to come up and chat with me. I'll be more than happy to answer or drop me an email or anything like that.